Well, hello, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Stacy Matrazo and I'm the executive director of the Florida Wildflower Foundation. Um, thanks for joining us for today's webinar, Invasive Species, Pathways, Process, Impacts, and Prevention. Uh, next week is National Invasive Species Awareness Week. So uh, it was a really good time to bring our guest on to talk about invasive species here in Florida, um, what the problems are and, and what, uh, what we can do. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with our organization, our mission is to protect, connect, and expand native wildflower habitats through our education, research, planting, and conservation programs. Our work is uh, made possible primarily through the sale and renewal of the Florida, excuse me, the state, Florida State Wildflower License Plate. Um, this is our old look here. We have a newer uh, version of it, but whether you have the old or the new license plate, you are supporting our work and we appreciate that. Uh, the funds we get from the license plate along with the donations and memberships allow us to support and create projects that build awareness and knowledge of native wildflowers and plants throughout Florida. We'd like to encourage those of you who find our programs valuable to consider becoming a member, making a donation, or purchasing that state wildflower license plate. And if you do purchase the plate, uh, you are eligible for a free membership with the organization. You just need to let us know that you have the tag and we'll set you up in our database. Um, be sure to check our website for resources on planting and growing wildflowers to learn where to see wildflowers in bloom, um, to see our upcoming events and so much more. Um, we're also on social media. You can find us on most platforms at FLA Wildflowers. Uh, next month, we have a really great um, webinar planned with James Stevenson. He is back again to talk to us about wind pollination. And then um, next month, we've got Tina McIntyre from UFIFAS on native plants to attract wildlife. We also have some great field trips coming up. This Friday, we'll be at Red Reef Park in Boca Raton. Um, this is a really good opportunity to see rare species, including the federally endangered beach cluster vine. Um, this trip will explore beach dune, coastal strand, and maritime hammock habitats. And we are doing this in partnership with the Institute of Regional Conservation. Um, next, uh, Next, excuse me, our next field trip is Pumpkin Hill uh, Creek, um, which is full, but you can sign up for our waiting list on our website. Um, we also have a trip in March to the Florida Everglades, um, which is also full, but we do have a waiting list for that too. So be sure to check out our website um, to learn how to sign up for that and um, see what else we've got coming up on our calendar. I just have a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. Um, all attendees are muted with cameras off. If you have questions um, during the presentation, please use the Q&A feature to submit them. Um, yes, the chat is active, but we will not be monitoring it for questions. So please use that Q&A to, um, to put your questions in for our presenter. We will address questions at the end of the talk as time permits. And if your question is not answered, you can email it to us at info at flawildflowers.org and we will get an answer to you. This webinar is being recorded. It'll be available on our YouTube channel and our website in about 24 to 48 hours. We'll also send a link to everyone who registered um, once the recording is available. So you'll receive that in your inbox as well. And now I would like to uh, introduce our speaker. Dia Lawrence is an extension scientist in the agronomy department at the University of Florida's Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences, or UF IFAS, to most of us. She's been the coordinator of the IFAS assessment of non native plants in Florida's natural areas since 2013. She received her PhD from Wright State University in 2012. And prior to that, spent uh, three years in Fort Lauderdale working on the development of biocontrol agents at the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture Invasive Plant Research Laboratory. Dia is the 2021 recipient of the Rita Beard Visionary Leadership Award from the North American Invasive Species Management Association, and she currently serves on their board of directors and idea committee and is the current chair of the Florida Invasive Species Council. 
She was also just named Vice President of the Invasion Ecology Section of the Ecological Society of America. Without further ado, I will hand it over to you, Dia. Thank you. Uh, yes, here we go. Come on now. All right. Um, thank you for the invitation to give this talk. And um, yeah, it's very um, timely uh, given NISA is next week. Um, I'm going to pack a lot of information into uh, the next 40 minutes or so. Um, but the, the, the bigger, uh, the big things that we will cover here are um, the invasion process, how we do management across the invasion curve. Uh, predicting and diagnosing biological invasions. And then I'll take you through my program, the IFAS assessment. Um, and at the end, we'll talk about some resources for you uh, to make informed um, beyond the IFAS assessment to make informed decisions about which plants you're going to use in your landscaping, including uh, how to navigate the many Florida plant lists and uh, talk about the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program at UF. Um, so first, uh, the invasion process is a stepwise process. There are, uh, you know, five steps, transport, introduction, establishment, spread, and then impacts, whether those are realized or not, um, evident or not. Um, and so at each of these stages, you can break down the process. So for example, a plant might be transported to a new area, but it never gets introduced to the, to the uh, open environment or the plant does get introduced, but the conditions aren't correct for it to establish. Uh, and at the next step, maybe uh, it, the plant requires a specialist pollinator and it can't reproduce. Um, so at each of those steps, you might break, you know, this whole thing might break down. And it's important to note that not all introductions result in an invasion. In fact, uh, you know, a small percentage, 10% uh, or less of the non-native plants that are introduced uh, actually become naturalized and even less of those become invasive and having those negative impacts. So just to walk through this process, um, first we'll talk about the transport system. Um, this, I love this, this map. Um, it really illustrates just how connected the whole world is. The white lines are air travel and the blue lines are shipping routes. And the darker the line, the more frequent the trip. Um, and you can just really see here just how, how much we are, are connected and moving stuff around. So here's just one of these cargo ships. And each one of these little boxes is a cargo shipping container. We ship tons and tons and tons of materials around every day. And Florida is, uh, you know, we have 30 some uh, ports of entry. Um, and, and the ports of Miami and Jacksonville welcome in a majority of the, the species that come into not just Florida, but the US. Uh, we also move things around here uh, in, in airplanes. Uh, and that's what, here, this is uh, what that looks like. Again, tons of, of things moving around, ample opportunity for intentional or unintentional introductions. And then to see uh, those, those introductions, they can come in that intentional category where you're planting them out in your yard for horticulture or in your field for ag or forage. This also includes aquaculture. We have a lot of aquatic invasives that come from you know, the, the aquarium aquaculture uh, industry. We also introduce things for erosion control, wildlife improvement. Um, and you can see here the probably the most famous example of uh, you know an intentional introduction gone wrong is the the story of kudzu. So in during the Great Depression when the Dust Bowl was happening, we had all these ecological refugees moving to the West Coast to the East Coast because literally the soil they were farming was just blowing away. Um, there was a movement to try to plant plants to fix that soil uh, so that you did, don't have um, the erosion. Uh, kudzu in the Southeast was one of those plants. So not only was it marketed to be a forage plant, 
Uh, it was also marketed to, to grow this vine over your porch. And we also planted millions of cuttings all along the roadsides in the Southeast uh, to try to fix that soil. And you can see in this photo here what the results were. Kudzu became the, the quote, vine that ate the South. Um, we also have introduc uh, accidental introductions. And so a good example, think of that cargo ship I just showed you, ballast water. Um, a lot of times with ballast water, um, you know, you're, you're loading down the ship, um, taking it over to the new place, unloading that cargo, you have to counterbalance the weight. And so with, with these ships, they use ballast water um, to kind of offset the, that weight. And if that ballast water is not treated, when they go to the new place uh, to, to, you know, reload the cargo, they have to dump the water. And if it's not treated, well, then you're introducing, uh, potentially introducing uh, non-native species that way. Um, here is an example of uh, unprocessed shipping materials. And so this could be pallets, moorings in those ships to hold cargo up. Um, there are, you know, pests that come over in that material of, if it's not if it's not treated. And so here is emerald ash, ash borer. We also have the Asian longhorn beetle. These are insects that come over in these um, the, this material. It's it's thought that's the introduction um, pathway for uh, EAB. And so the larva in the wood, the larva, you know, they mature, they come out, and now we have emerald ash borer. Um, it's thought that that first introduction was in the Michigan area. Um, and since then, it's moved all the way through uh, the Midwest. It's starting to hit the Southeast. There's a new population in, um, in Oregon in the Pacific Northwest. And this, this particular insect, the, the emerald ash borer, is wiping out an entire genus of trees, um, the, the, the ash trees. But also, we're a little worried about it here in Florida because we have uh, fringe trees and the pig, pygmy fringe tree. Uh, which are confamilials, and this ash borer can also mature on those. Um, so we're keeping an eye. We have monitoring traps at the border of Florida to try to make sure we know when and if those things arrive. Uh, and finally, we have hitchhikers. So think about when you're hiking, you might get like burrs or stickers on your, on your clothes. Um, that would be an example of hitchhiking. Um, it's important to understand your role. Um, this is. Uh, a pretty alarming statistic, I think, um, but 82, between 82 and 94% of all invasive species in the US has been linked in some way to the ornamental plant trade, forestry or agriculture. With that 82% from the Rikert 97 paper, um, that is just your woody plants, invasive woody plants in the US. And here you just see, this is uh, Mexican petunia um, and our friend, the calorie pear or Bradford pear introduced through horticulture. So once we get to the establishment phase, we wanna talk about um, there's biotic and abiotic, um, you know, things at play on whether or not a species can become established. So here's a simple climate match. Um, I've drew the lines to kind of show, you know, where the United States might overlap with regions in Asia, Europe, and Africa. And Florida in particular, um, is, it overlaps with some of the most biodiverse regions in the world. Um, lots of species, lots of potential climate matches. Here's what that might look like for mimosa. Um, here's the native range. You see all this mimosa here. Um, and if you overlaid these two things, uh, it, would, it would fit pretty nicely. So just a good example of climate matching here. In terms of biotic um, factors, uh, this is a pretty good illustration of spe specialists versus generalists. So a specialist like a koala requires specific uh, resources to, um, to grow and reproduce and establish in an area. Um, if you introduced a koala bear to say Ohio, it's not gonna make it because uh, you know not only does it not have the climate match, it doesn't have anything to eat as opposed to the feral hog here. Um, these, these hogs are generalists, they're omnivores, and they have a lot, a, a much broader, um, you know, range of what they can eat. Um, they can eat other animals, they can eat insects, they can eat plants. So they're there for that reason, um, widely spread across, uh, across, across the U.S. and in, in particular the Southeast. 
So back to plants here, talking about traits that influence the spread of, of plants. These aren't all of them, but they're uh, very common. Short time to reproduction. Uh, these plants that tend to make a lot of seeds. Uh, they're very good at uh, spreading those seeds around. And a lot of times um, you'll see, particularly in the grasses, the ability to spread vegetatively, like this bamboo, running bamboo here. This is Melaleuca, uh, South Florida, if you're familiar. Um, it's estimated that one Melaleuca tree might have 10 million seeds on it. So uh, it, you stress that tree out, those capsules um, open up and boom, you've got millions of Melaleuca seeds blowing around. And then of course, red showy fruits are gonna attract your, um, your bird dispersals. Next, we get to the impacts. This is where it gets a little sad. Um, we break these down into ecological, economic, and human health impacts. The photo here of this fire, this is a Melaleuca fire in the Everglades. This area is, uh, is adapted to um, low, slow fires. And what happened with Melaleuca when it went in there, you know, it invaded, developed these dense stands. Uh, Melaleuca is full of volatiles that are flammable. Um, and so when you have the fires in the Everglades, instead of those low and slow fires, we have very hot, fast fires. Um, they go up into the crown and kill off the other trees, kill off, um, you know, your plants underneath. So there is biodiversity loss with these Melaleuca fires. Um, other, other ecological impacts might be um, things like changes to uh, hydrology, um, changes to the what what nutrients are in the soil. Um, so it's not just fire. When we get to the economic impacts, um, you know, the, it's estimated the United States is invasive species has cost us somewhere around $1.2 trillion in the last 50 years. So these, these impacts are, are economic impacts are, are big and very real. Uh, we did a research project where we wanted to see how much we were spending on just invasive plant control in Florida. Um, so we basically were looking at how much we were spending on our conservation acres. That would be our state and our federal um, parks and different areas like that. Uh, we came up with a number, approximately $43 million per year, just in those areas is spent on invasive species man plant management. And this graph shows um, the blue is aquatic species, the green is terrestrial. Um, but here you can see just five species takes up the majority of that 43 million with hydrilla, um, water hyacinth, Melaleuca, again, Brazilian pepper tree, and our Ligodium species. So if we could just stop one of those, we could potentially save a lot of money and, and headaches. Also important to note that our agriculture suffers from the impacts of, uh, of uh, invasive species. And probably the most famous Florida example is right here with our citrus greening, um, costing millions of dollars a year in crop losses for our citrus industry. Moving on to human health, um, you know, human health impacts from plants might be as simple as you're allergic to the pollen of, say, one of the Eliagnus, the olives, you know, Russian olive, autumn olive, um, or you get an allergic rash from, you know, Brazilian pepper tree is in the same family as our, uh, you know, poison ivy, poison oaks. Um, a more dramatic example is here with our giant, uh, giant African land snail. Um, this thing is back. I, I, I'm not, I haven't heard any updates on where we are with the quarantine, but this is our third time eradicating the species. Why does it keep coming here? People are bringing it in for pet the pet trade. Um, but these snails are host to um, the uh, rat lungworm, which can be fatal to human beings. So we want to be mindful of, uh, of those human health impacts. Just want to take a pause and talk about climate change for, for a moment. Um, we know that we are in a climate change. <laughs> We're experiencing it now. Um, we're seeing sea level rise, uh, changes of the fire dynamics, both the intensity and the frequency and the timing of fire. Um, also our extreme weather events. Uh, here are three hurricanes that are stacked up, but it's not just our hurricanes. We're having, uh, you know, California and the big, you know, the, the, the precipitation that they had last month um, was not normal. 
the the tornadoes we're getting in the southeast are are not normal. Um, so these extreme weather events are of concern. And then we're not helping anything by turning green spaces into concrete. So urbanization is interacting with all this. And these things are interacting with invasive species and how invasive species are arriving, how they're um, how they're the impacts that they're they're having on the ecosystem, um, and how well we can control those species. And how that looks on our graph here, um, our figure here, is uh, just a couple examples. We're seeing new shipping routes with uh, the, you know, the sea ice melting. Um, the blue lines are traditional um, um, shipping routes. And the red is what we're going to get when um, you see here the Arctic Ocean. Uh, the ice isn't staying frozen as long. So we're going to be able to make more frequent trips that take less time. Um, this is one example. There are other examples around the world of how that's going to change. And so we might have different species going to different places or new species uh, with this you know, opportunity. In terms of establishment and spread, here is this is the um, uh, work of Mike Osland, and uh, he's with the USGS, uh, looking at the tropicalization of, uh, of Brazilian pepper tree. He's done these kind of models for a whole bunch of species, and it kind of holds true. Um, for species in Florida in particular, moving north. Uh, so you can see here, this is current temperatures and the distribution, uh, potential distribution of Brazilian pepper tree. And with two degrees, four degrees and six degrees Celsius increases, you can just see how that's, that um, potential range expands for, for that species. And again, that's just one species. We have a lot of uh, concern about range expansion with these warming temperatures. And then finally, intensification of these impacts. And so this is an example from the West. You have increases in drought. Um, the trees don't have as enough, you know, they're stressed out. They don't have as much protection. Uh, the bark beetles and other pests are getting in. You have these massive die-offs and then boom, you've got all that fuel to make fires um, more intense and um, um, cover a lot more ground. Okay, let's try to stop being so depressing. <laughs> Next up, we have the invasion curve. So we know all of the stuff that goes into an invasive species. Um, let's talk about management. So the invasion uh, curve is pretty simple concept. Once a species arrives, as you move across time, your area occupied will increase. So will the cost to manage it and over here, your eradication success declines. Um, this is divided into four sections, prevention, eradication, containment, and long-term maintenance control. Uh, this is the results of a economic analysis that shows for every dollar spent on, a, on prevention efforts, you get about $100 return on investment. And that diminishes across the, the curve where when you get into long-term, it's a one-to-one -to, -one to a one-to-five relationship. So we wanna stay up here in the prevention and eradication part of the curve. Prevention might look like this. Uh, this gentleman or, or person is uh, decontaminating a shipping container. Um, this is a part of an effort to, to, to make sure they're not introducing um, a crop pest that causes millions of dollars of damage in other areas. Um, we also have risk assessments, so we can try to predict what's going to be invasive before it gets here, and habitat suitability models. So um, if we're monitoring to make sure a species, you know, we, we want to know where to look for it to try to, to you know, get those prevention efforts in there, um, we know where to look. And here's a good example. This algae-ridden cruise ship it was asked to leave New Zealand waters. New Zealand and Australia have some of the best biosecurity measures in the world. Um, and they turned you know, this, this big cruise ship away because uh, they violated their laws about um, biosecurity. In terms of eradication, um, we know what you know, you have to have, know what you're looking for. We identify those. And then we have different ways of um, finding them. So a lot of times you'll see detector dogs. In Florida, we have the don't pack a pest. You'll see the beagles at uh, the airports. Um, we have, here's an eradication effort in the, uh, the Everglades. Um, the buoys here, uh, I believe they were, I can't confirm, but I think they were looking for um, some, uh, we have a 
some introductions of Cayman that they're trying to get rid of. Um, and then here's another success story, um, the eradication of this uh, grapevine moth in California. So um, here, we're going to stop it before it becomes established, essentially. In terms of containment, we want to prevent further spread, and this involves intense efforts to contain the core population and eradicate it uh, from new areas. So you're kind of managing on the invasion front. Um, so we want to do things like clean, drain, dry uh, your boat materials. Um, here's a boot brush to clean off um, your boot treads. You want to clean off your horse hooves if you're into that. Um, any equipment you're driving around, if you're recreationally or if you're a land manager, you want to clean the tread so you're not taking seeds from one area and move them, moving them to another. And then finally, control and management. This is maintenance control. We're just trying to keep our head above water so that we can preserve as much biodiversity and be able to use these natural areas um, as much as we can. Um, so here's just an example of water hyacinth um, and a couple a couple guys on an airboat spraying. Um, again, there's a lot of controversy around spraying these species uh, or you know spraying to this kind of management. Um, if we can prevent, we can stop having this conversation. So um, it's something to think about with prevention efforts. So how do we stay ahead of this curve? Um, well, for one, we have risk assessment uh, mentioned before. Think of risk uh, as the likelihood an event will happen and that there'll be those negative impacts. And so here on this uh, risk matrix, you can see likelihood, very unlikely, that moves up, the impacts, negligible to severe. Well, the way those, you can see, um, you know, we, we hit uh, that high risk area when, when as we move up those, those likelihoods. And the actual risk assessments are, um, you know, it's usually a protocol. Yeah, answer a bunch of questions. They're scored. Um, but we look at predicted introduction and, sp and spread. That's the event uh, and those negative impacts. And here is an example of the USDA model. Um, they divide their risk prediction into two elements, establishment and spread and impacts um, separate. The one I use for the IFAS assessment, those are they're all together. Um, basically the same questions. Um, but you can see here how those line up um, to see, you know, of course, higher impact. This should look, look like the risk matrix. Um, this one incorporates uncertainty, which is something uh, international standards have been calling for. We're trying to work on getting that into our program as well. And that's what that looks like. So it's like the wiggle around the prediction. And then finally, here are your maps, uh, clim uh, climate suitability maps. Status assessments, on the other hand, diagnose the invasion. So this is a specified uh, set of questions. Uh, we want to document, uh, the, you know, the document the evidence, and we assess one species at a time for a specific region. In Florida, we divide uh, divide the state into three zones um, for our recommendations using this. Uh, this is just a scleria um, um, uh, scleria species that was. Uh, identified very early uh, once it once it arrived we only have 13 points just right here there this is a uh, um, very quickly kind of took over this area so even with that that little bit of information there we were able to determine that it was invasive um, so we can try to make sure nobody's spreading that stuff around so that brings us to the IFAS assessment this is the program I oversee we have three tools uh, that predictive tools are risk assessment, status assessment. Um, you know, it's what what we we want to get the things before they get here with the predictive tool and the species that are already here. We use that status assessment. And then finally, the infra specific taxon protocol is uh, basically determines the invasion risk of cultivars of species. We know the parents are a problem. And here are the predict predictive tool. Um, we want to look at those new species, but also propo species proposed for a new use. So we have um, a big interest in growing biomass species in Florida, including this giant moso bamboo, which happens, happens to be one of those running species that think of that vegetative spread I showed. Um, they wanna grow this stuff for either biomass for biofuels or biomass this, you know, for building materials, We've even done um, some looked at some species for medicinal purposes. 
Um, and sometimes we do these for a specific requests. So Florida Friendly uh, Landscaping, which I'll show a couple slides at the end, um, they had a gap in their recommendation, you know, the species that they could recommend. And um, so we wanted to find some medium stature trees uh, that were low risk that they could put in their database. So I did a few species for them. Um, we have over 210 species in our database uh, that we evaluated with that tool. And here's our status assessment. We look at ecological impacts, the potential for expanded distribution and management difficulty. And you can have a species that um, might have one conclusion up here and a very different conclusion in South Florida, hence the zones. And which makes sense because there are very different climates between um, you know, Miami-Dade and uh, say Apalachicola. Uh, we wanna look at the potential for expanded distribution and how hard is it to manage. And we do this by um, gathering data from people in the field. I have over 500 species in my database uh, that have been evaluated this way. And we regularly reevaluate to make sure we're capturing that invasion. The infraspecific taxon protocol, this is our cultivars. And um, this is a great time to talk about pothos. Um, pothos is becoming a real big problem in South Florida um, and in Central Florida. And uh, we're starting to see it, uh, you know, I'm seeing more of it in North Florida. And essentially your pothos in your house looks like this, but out in the field, I mean, these leaves are massive if you're not familiar. Um, we had someone that wanted to release pothos cultivars. And basically I did a, uh, an assessment to see, I just wanted, you know, we look to see if it's uh, gonna behave like the parent species. And then our recommendations, it's usually within the university, that they go through our cultivar release um, process. Um, these species, I think were, these cultivars were released um, with very specified uses, like where it could be released um, and, you know, specifically keep this thing in your house. Um, here's how you get to the assessment website. Um, this is where you can look up if you're curi curious about species, you can um, type it in here if you know what you're looking for, or if you click here or up here, you can see all of the species that we have. We also have, a, you have the ability to filter by conclusion zone, growth form, and other, other, um, other ways in the, in the dropdown. And then if you wanna curate your own list, say you're in North Florida and you're interested in vines, that are invasive that you want to avoid, you can pull that specific information. Here's what a species page looks like. I really have it out for pothos lately, I guess. Um, but but here you can see, um, you know, we provide some photos, and then here is the information that you would want to, um, you know, this tells you to avoid it. Uh, here. Uh, is the score it received on that risk assessment. And then we provide some links um, for, you know, if you want to look at the plants database, for example, for any um, like distribution information. Our conclusions are color-coded stoplight, red light, yellow light, green light. Um, for status assessment, you'll see invasive, caution, or not a problem species. Um, the university it has a, uh, a policy that they can't recommend species that are in that invasive no uses or invasive category. Cautions, they have to, um, if they do want to recommend it, they have to indicate that it should be managed to prevent escape. And then our risk assessment, uh, predictive tool conclusions, same implications, but different words. You'll see risk, high invasion, moderate, uh, moderate risk, and low invasion risk. Okay, I'll take a breath here and move on to Florida plant lists. This is another, um, you know, the, these are other uh, places that you can look uh, to find information about plants and resources um, that, that uh, could be very helpful to you. Uh, first, it's important to note that not all lists are regulatory, um, but regulatory lists prevent the sale movement or spread of listed species often with legal and financial penalties if you violate those terms, and they're maintained and enforced by federal or state agencies. Whereas these non-regulatory lists serve as recommendations or guidelines. So the IFAS assessment is a non-regulatory list. Um, these, you know, we're, we put these things on the list based on what I've already explained, and they're often uh, supported with that data. So you can, you can either request the information if you wanna know more, 
or it's already provided for you on um, you know, where you're looking for it. So the federal noxious weed list was enacted in 75. Um, Department of Agriculture manages this one. Um, it restricts all interstate or foreign movement of these species. And um, there have been amendments. Uh, it's been a little while since they've added species. For the most part, these are agricultural weeds, um, but we there are some species that have been added uh, that are some things that we might see in our natural areas, including these are present in Florida, your Kogan grass, hydrilla, Japanese climbing fern, soda apple, melaleuca, and giant salvinia. Um, don't move this stuff around. You're breaking a federal law. Um, in Florida, we have the Florida State Noxious Weed List and um, Florida Department of Ag um, oversees this, specifically the Division of Plant Industry. Um, and this restricts movement within the state. Uh, and I've actually seen where people have, you know, gotten, FDEX has reached out to a couple of folks, um, you know, for selling Brazilian pepper tree um, wreaths at Christmas time on Etsy. Um, so they do enforce this. Uh, they're pretty lenient when it comes to warnings, but um, they do uh, follow up if you were to report something. Here's a few species that are on that list, beach phytix, Japanese honeysuckle, and cat's claw vine. And now we move to the Florida Invasive Species Council. And we have a plant list committee. I serve on that committee. Um, we try to coordinate the assessment and the FISC list. Um, so basically, uh, this is more of a consensus building exercise. So somebody puts in a petition for species to be listed as either a category one or two, and uh, we review it, we debate it, we have a vote, and then um, the board of directors approves it. And cat ones are shown to alter native plant communities by displacing native species, changing community structures or ecological functions or hybridizing. And here are some examples, uh, ear leaf acacia, this is uh, bishop wood and camphor tree. For cat twos, those who have increased in abundance or frequency, but not have have not yet altered the Florida plant communities. So these are borderline becoming a big problem. So we have Melaleuca viminalis, such a bottle brush tree, um, coconut, believe it or not, <laughs> um, and then coral vine. So now just to talk about Florida friendly landscaping, this is a program University of Florida offers. Um, there are, you know, you go to the website. There are links for community land, say you're an HOA, um, landscape professionals, but uh, this is the information for individuals. Um, they provide uh, a list of species, both natives and non-natives, that are double-checked against the IFAS assessment, so they aren't recommending plants they shouldn't be. Um, and then they provide all this stuff to help you, you know, figure out what you might want to grow um, in your, in your um, landscape. Um, they do offer a landscape certification pro uh, program that uh, you can get silver uh, certification. For that, you have to remove all your state or federally listed species. Um, and I have all of the, not all the federal, but I have all the state ones in the IFAS assessment, assessment database. Gold, list, uh, gold status, no listed species with, uh, with no species I'm sorry, no listed species and no species with conclusions of high risk or invasive not recommended from the IFAS assessment. And they do have checklists. Here's part of the checklist for gold. Um, and this is where we come in, but you can see there's other, it's not just the invasion stuff. Um, you know, here you have to have 15 plants in your landscape, um, you know, these kind of things that I, I you should see my yard, it, it would not qualify. <laughs> um, also, there's an, uh, a, a book available, um, IFAS Bookstore has the Plant This, Not That book. Um, and so here's just an example, um, you know, Lantana is a terrible invader in Florida. People still plant it, move it around. We do have some sterile cultivars, um, but what would be even better uh, to plant this, um, this button sage? Uh, they provide identification guides written to help people find safe alternatives to invasive ornamental plants, including trees, shrubs, vines, and ground covers. Um, so I think I've left plenty of time for questions, um, but I do want, if, if you want to jot down my email, if there's anything we don't cover in the question and answer, 
uh, or you have any questions or concerns about invasive plants in the state, um, you can reach out to me at dmlorance at ufl.edu. Also, the assessment, um, the assessment website here, if you do the contact us, those emails come directly to me. Uh, and so I will stop the share and I'm happy to take your questions. Oops. Thank you. Thank you, Tia. Um, that was really um, informative. And we've got a few questions coming in. Um, and I, I had this question too, but uh, a lot of the species that um, are considered invasive are, you can purchase them at garden centers or big box stores. You can purchase them online. Most people don't know that they're invasive, especially because they're being advertised as pollinator friendly or, you know, suitable for any landscape. Um, is there anything that can be done to, to, aside from educating the consumer, which we're all trying to do, but is there any effort to stop the sale of plants that we know to be, especially category one invasives? Yeah, um, without doing a noxious weed petition and getting it put on the list, um, there's little that we can do in, in that regard. Um, some, some regional, you know, like uh, municipalities or counties, like on a smaller level, have some regulations that are based on the, you know, for example, the FISC list, or I wish they would use ours too, but usually it's the FISC list. And if you're not familiar, um, Florida Invasive Species Council used to be FLEPSI. We changed the name a couple of years ago. Um, so in terms of being able to do something with, you know, without that regulation, we can't do much. Um, but I will say that the growers and the breeders are getting better about recognizing invasive species um, as an issue and not wanting their names associated with something that becomes a problem. So mm -hmm. I'm seeing a lot of movement. Um, they're still not, you know, you know, as risk averse as I am. Um, but the, you know, we're seeing some good cultivars being developed that are sterile for, like I mentioned, the lantana. I've evaluated quite a few cultivars of lantana that, um, you know, they don't make fruit and they don't spread. And, you know, they're, you, the genetics, it's not possible for them to revert back to something that would reproduce. So they're making alternatives or growing alternatives. Maybe it's not going native, but, um, but they're, they're, they're making an effort and listening. Um, so yeah, I, I wish, you know, beyond education, uh, I, mm -hmm. I wish we could do more, but, um, you know, things like this, uh, you know, that's, that's how I'm trying to get the word out. Yeah, us too. <laughs> um, okay, I have a question um, from CJ. As a part of your assessment, are you referring to the Florida Plant Atlas to see what's being vouchered in different areas, um, especially first time non-native sightings in natural areas? Yeah, we use um, we use the the um, the plant atlas and Ed Maps um, to. Mm -hmm. If you're not familiar with Ed Maps, it's a way that you can document non-native species or invasive species uh, with your with an app on your phone. Take a picture and upload it, and your phone automatically gives you those geo reference points, so we know where to go look for it. If say you saw it on a hike, um, both of those things we use in the assessment. To kind of keep track mostly of the species that we know you know i'm already keeping an eye on they're already in the database i really rely on say you know some of the botanists at these herbar herbaria um contacting me if something weird shows up um to, to try to get it in the in the database so we work pretty closely with um um with the plant atlas and the florida um, uf Her herbarium Great. There's a couple of questions um, suggesting that there's maybe some um, disconnect between the, the EDIS docs, the, the recommendations for plants, and the, what's actually being documented as invasive. Um, Jennifer specifically called out the ficus carica. I'm not familiar with that, but, but it, why would a plant be recommended if it's a known invasive? So it's not supposed to be. Um, the, the issue with that is that there was a researcher at UF years ago, um, Edward Gilman, I'm not calling him out for <laughs> to, to slander him in any way, but he had a grad student develop a bunch, like hundreds of, 
of these edis documents on each you know species to species and we just haven't gotten them all um so mm -hmm. i've been working very closely with um diana hagan at edis who kind of oversees the whole thing um we catch them when we can i let her know uh you know what to pull or what to to, to do, but I mean, there's thousands of EDA socks. So one of the things, solutions we did come up with is um, they're, they're working on a crawler or something to, to a plugin on the, the, the page that would automatically pull the conclusion from the assessment. So even if you have the, the wrong information in the, mm -hmm. until we get caught up with all of these species, um, you would still have something at the top that 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 told you it was you know its invasion status and is there well i don't know if i want to encourage this or not but is there someone that if people see this can they report it or is that um not something that you guys would want happening um, at this point don't send it to me <laughs> <laughs> um you could you could contact the edis office um definitely Okay. If you contact me, I just have to contact them. So, um, but I, I'm happy okay. to look at it too. <laughs> when we can get that information, we send out a resource sheet at the end of this, so we can include that as well. Um, you mentioned that, um, you know, how you guys come do the evaluations and that sometimes it's upon request if somebody's wanting to, to do something in a larger scale. Um, but with so many non-natives, here and more coming in regularly at what point do you start looking at a plant's invasive potential like if someone isn't approaching you with a concern or it hasn't already gotten to that point what do you what's the prediction or the determinability for studying it yeah so th that's one of the biggest problems in what we do um you know both in florida um hawaii has a similar program um they do risk assessments over there and on a national level with USDA, most of the stuff is on our radar for some reason or another. Um, so for that reason, um, it's in review right now. The paper's in review, but we did what's called a horizon scan. And so horizon scanning for invasive plants, basically you take a list of species that are um, not in the area, that have a potential climate match, but aren't where you are. The area of concern and so we started with 9,600 species whittled that down to it and this was all taxa but we whittled it down to an amount that we could handle in the time we had to do it so we didn't evaluate everything it's not perfect um but we did identify 40 species of concern for florida um, that we determined were high risk they were going to cause impacts um some of them human health like uh this crab-eating macaque um, you know, we have the, the rhesus macaques in Florida that carry the deadly strain of herpes, uh, that presumably this macaque could, could also, so we were, you know, that one got a very high score based on its human health, potential human health impacts. So we have that list, um, the plants, we only identified six and I've, I did the risk assessments and those are in our database and we hope to go back and take that list. Um, that we, the ones we didn't look at and try to keep whittling away at, at, I mean, that's, that's the best we can do. Um, we also are about to launch another project. This is a national 50 state horizon scan of all the plants in trade. So we will, you know, this is probably two years out, wow. but we really have a really comprehensive idea of what plants are being sold and moved around that have the potential to cause problems in the U.S. And, you know, we'll have it divided up by ecoregions uh, is the way, way we're looking now. Um, but, but you know, hopefully we can get a really good handle on what's coming, um, including uh, trying to get folks uh, at the our botanical gardens and our public gardens. You know, those are the folks that are going and exploring, trying to find new stuff to bring over. And so <laughs> we're incorporating their lists as well. Um, so that's the best I can think of. I don't know what else to do. <laughs> I'm sure it's a lot to keep up with. So, yeah. Um, so, okay. I know you need to, um, get going. I, I want to ask one last question, a combination of the last remaining questions here that have to do with, um, the master gardener program being an IFAS program as well. Um, what kind of communication happens there? Uh, particularly Patty's asking if a new species is added to the invasive list, is that getting, 
um, notified to Extension and Master Gardeners or any of the other IFAS programs? Yeah, so I do a lot of talks for the Master Gardener programs, different counties. Um, so we try to get the word out that way. Um, Master Gardeners are also, um, you know, I present at the, they do a meeting every year. It's kind of like sort of the coordinators uh, from around the state, the, the county extension agents and, and such to kind of give them an idea so that they can, we try to get it to sort of trickle down. Um, but they aren't supposed to be, you know, if you see a master gardener selling a plant that's on the, they don't have to, they don't have to pay attention to the FISC list. But if they're selling something that's invasive or high risk on the IFAS assessment list, um, they shouldn't be doing that. So um, we do, we have a committee um, that kind of makes decisions about, they, they kind of oversee me and we make, you know, the voting about cultivars and stuff, um, the invasive plant uh invasive plant working group at UF. Um, we have um, two of the higher ups in master gardeners sit on that council or on that committee. Um, so Wendy Wilbur, and I think we have Tom Wickman on there as well. So we do our best to keep them plugged in, but you know, there are some master gardeners that get real, real upset when their favorites end up on the invasive <laughs> list. And, you know, we had a pretty big dust up when um, Melaleuca viminalis, um, you used to be Calistamon, the bottle brush. Um, you know, I have land managers telling me that they're seeing it in the Everglades. Um, mm -hmm. Something that we thought wasn't going to be a problem. And I've, I'm like, why would why would it become a problem when you look at Melaleuca, uh, Quinquinervia is right. everywhere? So I think we're, we're just in a lag phase right now with bottle brush. So we put it into the inv high invasion risk category. Um, and folks got very upset about that. And, you know, we're like, we're just trying to prevent invasions. Like it's not personal. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yes. yeah. All right. Well, thank you. It's, it's a little before three and, um, I want to be respectful of your time. So I think we got through most of our questions. Um, if we do get any others, uh, emailed to us, then we will definitely, um, put them through to you. And, uh, we'll also get, um, some of the links that you, provided out in our resources sheet as well. So thank you so much for your time today and for this great information. And um, and yeah, if anyone likes what they saw today, please also consider supporting our work at flawildflowers.org. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for, for inviting me. I really enjoyed it. I appreciate it. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.